I met Simon and Felix because um, they had released, um, I think it was the first record on Atlantic Jacks. I was actually in Liverpool at the time studying and um, I was, I had a little radio show up there and I was running parties and writing about music and um, was DJing as well. And um, their, I can't remember exactly which track came out, but their, one of their first tracks came out. And um, I've been kind of into um, playing a lot of more drum and bass and kind of left field stuff at that time. Um, I had been into house as well, but a lot of the house that was coming out at the time was kind of what I would have called kind of mainstream and a little cheesy. And um, their sound came along and it really excited me. So I um, I knew when I, was, I left college or university that I was uh, wanting to go into the music industry and because that was kind of my passion. And I wrote them a letter um, when I got, I bought this record and wrote them a letter um, and it was Atlantic Jacks Inc., which is uh, an American, obviously an American term for an incorporated business. So I had, I was kind of confused. I wasn't sure whether they were kind of, um, I, I, you know, I, I knew that they were British, but it was, it was like an ink label. Um, so I thought, well, maybe it's come out from America. Anyhow, I, did, I managed to find out their address and I wrote to them and said I wanted to work with them because I loved their, their music. So when I moved to London, um, I started working in music PR. Um, I worked at a couple of small record labels and then I worked at a company called Pop Promotions. And um, I, yeah, I just said to them, I'd love to be involved. So they got back to me and um, they said, oh, well, you know, why don't, you, why don't we meet? And we met and I believe we met, um, certainly if, I can't remember the foot necessary if it was the first time, but I, I remember they said, okay, why don't you help us um, mail out our record? to DJs and to journalists and stuff like that. So I, I guess my first interaction with them was um, sitting, I believe, at Felix's house or apartment and um, or flat, I should say, and um, mailing out records, uh, stuffing mailers. And um, from that point, we started to, I started to basically represent uh, Atlantic Jacks in terms of doing their PR. Um, and they had done, I believe, one party maybe two small like parties for their friends um and you know we started working together and i said oh you know why don't we you know continue this on a more regular basis the parties because obviously if you're releasing 12 inches uh or singles you're not doing it very that frequently um and it seemed to me first of all obviously we like to everyone likes to to go to you know part good parties and hear good music um, but it was also about maintaining a kind of presence in the market uh, and having their name constantly kind of um, talked about when there wasn't records released. And they were also very, you know, excellent DJs. Um, so that's kind of how we met. So basically helping them mail out their records. That must have been a crazy exciting time for you because you, you were still at university. So you were, you, you had you graduated by I'd that point? I'd left university by this point. I was okay. back, I was down in London, yeah. Okay. And that was the music marketing route was that something that you'd sort of decided on prior to meeting them or did that kind of influence your path a bit yeah i mean i was just kind of mad uh, obsessed with with you know new and emerging electronic music from all, of all genres really and um so yeah i just kind of was was passionate about that and wanting to you know get into the the scene in london because obviously i'd been up in liverpool for well four years um, prior to that, I lived just outside of London, um, and so I was I was into the music there. And there were small clubs where I um, grew up, which was just outside London near Slough. Um, so there were there's things like um, Shave Your Tongue in in um, Bracknell, which was a club night. There was um, the Greyhound, um, which was a pub where like the the Flying Records um, and Junior Boys Own and people like that were doing doing parties. So um, yeah, I was kind of into it. And then um, I had, my grandmother had lived in Dulwich, or, you know, she's passed now, but um, she lived in Dulwich. So as a kid, I used to drive with my mum and dad in to, to go and visit my grandparents in Dulwich. And we always used to go through Brixton. Um, and I loved, I loved that kind of energy that I could see even just as a kid, you know, looking out the window of the car and driving through. Um, and so when I moved to London, um, 
Brixton was where I wanted to go and live. And so the, I, I had moved to Brixton. Um, I was working, as I said, for a couple of record labels. Um, you know, and we were all kind of on the dole, getting housing benefit and just doing, they were very small jobs, obviously, you know, for, for cash. Um, and yeah, and then so I met the guys and obviously they were based in South London, um, in Brixton, Clapham, I think, at the time. And uh, kind of went from there. So can you describe for us what those earlier parties were like? Because you said they'd done a, a couple for friends and kind of close people and then you were wanting to kind of take them into bigger crowds or bring more people in? Yeah, I mean, it was obviously, um, you know, they were they were pretty busy uh, producing stuff. Um, and um, I set up a small company called Reverb PR, which was based... Um, I can't remember the name of the road. It's the road that connects um, Cold Harbour Lane with Brixton Hill. So there's the town hall Acre on Lane? the corner Acre. there. Sorry? Is it Acre Lane? Borden Road, that's it. Okay, Borden Road. Borden Road. So that we had a little office. My uh, business partner, Simon, who is a, a friend from when I was growing up, um, he was also into music, and we set up a small company called Reverb PR based in Borden Road. And the first couple of parties that we I was involved with were in the crypt um, under St. Matthew's Church. Yeah. And um, they were fairly crazy so what, in, in all the right ways. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what kind of music were, were Felix and Simon and, and you sort of promoting in, from those parties that kind of wasn't there before? Like, how was it changing the landscape? Well, I think it was an interesting mix because it kind of brought the worlds of jazz dance um, and the, you know, the kind of music that, that was, you know, that there'd been a big whole movement that I'd kind of been involved with um, going to clubs um, out in the home counties, which was kind of Giles Peterson, S, Kevin Beadle, all these kind of DJs. Um, so it had that kind of jazz dance, um, very, you know, kind of uh, black oriented music. Um, and then they were bringing in, um, obviously, a U.S. house sound, yeah. which was, you know, kind of a, a really good combination. So that the, the nights always kind of started um, with kind of a this kind of eclectic mix of of jazz and soul and rare groove, uh, and then sort of as the night progressed in terms of the time uh, and the volume of people, obviously the the tempo picked up and um, it you know got it went more house. And how much do you think those parties were influenced by Brixton? How do you think? How much do you think Brixton was influenced by the parties? Like in terms of uh, kind of where the influences were coming from. Well, definitely, obviously the uh, the energy, the street energy of Brixton, which is obviously part of the attraction of living there, was this kind of melting pot of cultures. Um, obviously, predominantly Afro Caribbean uh, and West African. Um, was particularly dominant and, uh, you know, still is what, you know, the, the makeup of the fabric of, of Brixton it makes it so appealing is this kind of these connections with, with music in terms of, um, you know, obviously reggae and dub, um, but also, you know, um, Afrobeat. And, I um, mean, you know, there was a lot of Nigerians who were playing, um, you know, fella at the time and you'd, you'd hear, hear that in the street and then you'd hear, um, reggaeton or sort of early parts of reggaeton, um, dance hall, and so that 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 those just all of those musical genres really influenced, I think, their sound um, and the kind of general uh, sort of music that we were playing. And th the kinds of people that were coming to the parties, Felix um, describes the the people coming and the, the mixes of people that were coming, kind of encouraging different people to come through Brixton because he he mentioned. Um, the fact that when he first started coming, he was aware of, you know, people saying very negative things about it that was dangerous and that, um, you know, you shouldn't go there and so, and, and whatnot. Um, and he was kind of keen for people to see a different side of it and to engage with it. Did that, did any of that kind of occur to you at the time? Well, I mean, that you know, Brixton certainly had obviously got a, a reputation and a history of, of uh, you know, of, civil unrest um or riots predominantly and um you know it was a it, it was definitely a barrier for some people for me that was kind of the energy and realness of the of the of the place because so much um 
you know, other parts of London um, that, you know, I was, I, I worked quite a bit um, in West London in Notting Hill, which obviously also had a similar history, but I think Notting Hill had become quite gentrified by that point and had lost a lot of that kind of raw energy. And, um, you know, Brixton really had that still. Um, I, I, you know, I haven't lived there for a long time, so I'm not able to comment on where it is now, but it was really, there was a real energy. And I think that the edginess of it, um, you know, was, was part of that. And I think that was part of the, the kind of energy of the, of the club and part of the energy of the whole scene. And I think what's interesting is that it really did bring a lot of different people together. Clubs at that point had got into this stage of kind of, um, you know, there were super clubs, um, you know, Gatecrasher and Cream and all of those clubs that were kind of pretty mainstream. And, um, you know, in some respects, they kind of lost the party element. They were clubs rather than parties. And I think we, you know, Basement Jacks was a party, not a club. I mean, it, it was a club, it went into club listings and all of that, but it was really a party. Um, and it was a party that brought together uh, different walks of life in a way that, um, you know, essentially was the kind of ethos of Acid House, which was, you know, all coming together to, to celebrate, you know, music and life. And that, how important was that distinction for you, the difference between um, a party and a club um, in terms of, you know, how, how aware do you think people who were coming to parties were of that distinction between the two different things? Oh, I think they were really aware because, you know, it, it, all of the venues that we hosted the, the parties at were, well, there was the crypt, obviously, and that was just a space. Um, I mean, there was a kind of a bar that was really a restaurant and then it turned into, uh, you know, a more late night hangout. And then we did took it to the George the Fourth, which was, um, for me, um, the, the George the Fourth was really where it started to blow up. Um, and, you know, that's a, a pub that is frequented by people leaving Brixton Prison. Um, it's their first port of call or was their first port of call. Uh, after they were released. It was a real boozer. It was like a London old school pub. It had carpet. Um, and, you know, hosting it there was kind of, um, it just felt very real and it didn't have that kind of, you know, nightclub energy or like, a, you know, we brought all the sound in, we brought lights in and the light lighting was pretty minimal actually um, and basic. And again, that was kind of part of the whole vibe that it was, um, you know, it was really just a, bunch of people coming together and having fun and I think people really got that and I think it was a real uh, antidote to kind of the more mainstream West End cor- well, you know, corporate clubbing which is, was a term that was kind of used at that time. Right, because um, the, the restaurant you mentioned, was that Taco Joe's? No, Taco Joe's was the place where I think they first had the party and I hadn't, I hadn't didn't go to Taco Joe's. It was, I think Taco Joe's was in an arch. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, so I didn't ever go to that one. I think, so I started going and getting involved at the crypt. Right, okay. So how much of that was like a stylistic choice and how much of it was kind of out of necessity? Because obviously, you know, costings of everything at the time, there wouldn't have been a lot of money going around. Um, So kind of what were the sort of priorities in terms of putting on the night? Um, The priorities were good sound, as good a sound as we could get with um, renting a a system. and the yeah it was kind of raw and i mean it was out of necessity but it was also out of aesthetic and that you know that was what we were about and it was more about the people and the music um and the 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 moments the shared moments rather than the glitz and the glamour and dressing up i mean people didn't you know it was extremely hot and sweaty in all the pretty much all the venues that we hosted the parties at so you you'd leave drenched (laughs) excellent it wasn't air conditioned at all (laughs) It's funny because we were um, we were going through the different venues with Felix the other day, and so many of them have turned into Tesco Expresses now. Like I, the... know. I think both <laughs> pubs have, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So many of them have, um, but in yeah, particular the ones where you guys. Are... <laughs> it's really really strange um, to look at them now because obviously it's really it's really different now, and um, and I wonder how much of a kind of um, specific moment you saw that as because looking back at it now there was a real opportunity there to be able to do those sorts of things in those spaces when they existed and they don't kind of exist in the same ways anymore um 
do you look back at that time as sort of a special moment that you had a lot of freedom or do you think there are different freedoms now that um that that people have in other ways well i think that um one of the most interesting uh, you, you know things for me and how things have changed is that is obviously social media um, we did have mobile phones, but they didn't have cameras on them and they didn't have apps or anything like that. So everyone who was there, even though they might be able to communicate text with each other, what have you, they were very much in the moment and, you know, present. Uh, and there's no like, I mean, yes, we did take photos. I've got, I've got quite a few photos of the parties, but, um, I mean, the quality was pretty, you know, with all the steam and heat, you know, you, all you get is a lot of kind of uh you know blurry images but i you know i think we did have freedoms um we were lucky in that um it was it was it was a kind of underground um and it was a you know we communicated about the parties through um bill posting in brixton and around and, we, and and simon and i as promoters of the night uh that was kind of one of our main roles so we would literally go out with wallpaper paste uh, and, you know, um, Felix would uh, create the posters, um, which were always, I don't know if you've seen any of them, but they were always sort of Xerox together. Um, they weren't slick. There was no uh, Photoshop or InDesign being used. It was all very much cut, literally cut up bits of, you know, photocopies. Um, and of course, we, you know, that was an aesthetic as well. It was very much that raw kind of just like, Here's the information, the logo, the event, where it is, da da da. Um, who's playing? Um, and you know, I think people really liked that. It was just kind of raw, and yeah. So we were we were really lucky that that you know, there were pubs that were willing to put the parties on. I mean, they were willing to put them on because, frankly, um, these were not the most popular of pubs. They were kind of old old men pubs, um, and we brought in a, obviously a lot of business um, and a lot of fun. One question I had about you, and because you set up your business um, yeah. in Brixton, and then, um, and so how significant was I suppose that time and those parties, but also being in Brixton for your own development of your own creative enterprises and then your own career path later? Oh, it was completely. You know, at Brixton, it was completely central. Um, you know, we I had worked initially um, for. A, PR company, music PR company over in um, Notting Hill on Kensal Rise. And um, then when we set up Reverb, it was, you know, we definitely wanted to be, I mean, we were living in Brixton um, and we wanted to be in the heart of where, you know, our inspiration came from. Um, so it was, it was really central. And I also ran another club called Scaramanga, um, um, which was upstairs at the Dog Star. And we actually, um, we did one at the fridge as well. Um, and then we did boat parties. So obviously the boat parties weren't in Brixton, but, um, yeah, our office, um, well, actually our first office was on cold Harbor lane, oh, okay. which oh. it was actually next door to the dog star. And, um, it was uh, literally a room. Um, and that was it. And, uh, three of us worked out of that room promoting the, the party, but we were obviously doing, um, promoting a lot of record labels as well. We worked with a lot of French artists, which is why, um, you know, at Scaramanga, um, we had Dimitri from Paris, Philippe Starr um, from Cassius, rest, rest in peace, he recently passed. Um, and then obviously Daft Punk also came to play at um, one of the Basement Jacks parties. And that um, those parties are upstairs at the Dog Star, um, did they yeah. come? Did they come out of the basement jacks parties? Like how? How was that development? How did that all kind of? Uh, I've been out? working um, with with all these French artists, um, predominantly initially with Dimitri from Paris, um, and but also a lot of uh, other UK labels, and um, by this point some US labels. Um, and Scaramanga was really um, an opportunity to showcase. Um, those artists and artists that we were really into um, in Brixton. So it was kind of, you had Basement Jacks and, and Simon and Felix played, played at Scaramanga a number of times, but we, they were kind of separate entities. One was kind of a lot, as I said, really bringing in a lot of French artists, but also marrying them with, you know, um, I worked a lot with Patrick Forge, um, who was on Kiss FM at the time. Um, and I had a Tuesday night with him at the Dog Star called Forgery. Um, which ran for about three years every Tuesday. So, 
you know, my office was literally next door to the dog store. So on a Tuesday night, we'd be we'd be playing there. And yeah, I mean, we, we just hung out in Brixton all the time. And that was kind of our, you know, we didn't go that far afield after that. <laughs> There's enough to do. <laughs> and how long did you stay there? Before you um, I stayed, I lived in Brixton from 95 to 2003. Okay. And then after that, you went into town or did you move to the States after that? I moved to, to New York, yeah. Okay. And that, that's where you are now, is that right? Yeah, I'm upstate New York at the moment. Okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I live in Brooklyn. Okay. Um, and so just uh, finally, um, what kind of... Um, when you guys were developing that whole scene, um, did you ever, when it all started off, did you ever imagine it being as big and significant as it came to be? Like, did you, was that kind of the plan for you guys or did it, how, or, or was it sort of organic and it naturally grew that way? Um, I, I always had huge, you know, huge respect and, and passion and belief in their music. I mean, I, they were really, you know, Simon and Felix were really um, in that um, first couple of albums. I felt their sound was really, you know, it's just really, uh, it's like, I think, uh, you know, music is when it, different elements come together and they make that perfect new kind of dish, as it were, if you think about ingredients coming together. And it's bringing things that hadn't re really been mixed together. So I, I kind of knew their sound um, was, you know, destined for, I knew that, that they would go, you know, big. I had, I had total confidence in that. Um, and, and you know, some of their, some of the, um, the, the edits and um, that they would play at the club because obviously they they tested a lot of tracks through the club through the through the parties um, before they were released. Um, they also did tons and tons of edits. Um, so you you know yeah I had no doubt that they were they were going to go and um, you know be huge as as they have been. And for your own for yourself and for your own career development, um, mm. is it something that when you were there at that time? Um, is it something that you envisage like, oh, this is gonna, you know, this is gonna propel us, and we will be able to do this and that and the other, or, or, or was that for you personally? Was that also quite organic? Yeah, I, we weren't strategic, right, at all. <laughs> um, I mean, I think you know, there, there of course, people, you know, everyone had ambition and, and sort of, you know, dreams, but I think really um, we were very much living in the moment, as I said, and it was kind of. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it, I mean, but there was London in those days. I mean, I, I, as I said, I, you know, I'm not uh, spending that much time in parties and clubs now, but the energy was really kind of amazing at the time because you had so much new music um, and it certainly defined that generation, you know, the Acid House kind of generation of um, people coming together, which, you know, people have been very much, I think, um, defined by their music, uh, musical taste. And I think that's, you know, maybe less so now um, because of, I guess, the, you know, availability of every type of music, at, you know, on, you know, on your fingertips, on your computer. But then, you know, finding, um, you know, original music and finding new music and rare music really was about who you were and as a kind of an identity signifier. So I think, um, you know, we all grew out of that. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, moved on to do different things or, you know, have different interests. But it was really, you know, it was very defining, I think, for all of us. And, yeah, I would, you know, I mean, it, they were very special, very, very special times and lots of amazing friends and experiences that, you know, still, um, you know, I have friends from all over the world that used to come to those parties and I'm still good friends with them. So it was pretty, yeah, it was a good times. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much, Richard. I really, really appreciate you speaking to me. Thanks. Is there anything else that we haven't covered that you, you'd like to talk about or you'd like to mention? Um, no, I mean, I think that the only thing that, you know, Brixton just has uh, a really good, I think, it, you know, to Felix's point that people were frightened or scared of, of being there, um, I never really felt that i mean i was very lucky i guess in that you know and i and we were in you know on cold harbor lane and at times you know that could there, there was you know shit went down um but it was i always found there was a really good soul to the to the i guess i call it a town or a village in the city that um you know and it had lots of kind of individuals and freaks um 
Uh, and there was always, always, always some tension, but it felt to me that that was very real. And I think that's it's the realness of Brixton and the melting pot and the fact that all these people are coming together and learning about each other that is is the powerful kind of energy, the special energy that it has or had. I, I, yeah, I, I know it's, I'm sure it's changed somewhat, but um, I, you know, I, I did actually have my 40th birthday party upstairs at the, um, at the Dog Star. And so a lot of people came you know, that I hadn't seen for a long time, because obviously I've been abroad. Um, and, you know, it, there was still that energy there. That's really special. So it's obviously left a really important mark on you if you came back, all the way back, <laughs> for your for Yeah, your yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, have a, I have a flat in um, up by uh, Brockwell Park still, so um, obviously I don't live in it. But, um, yeah, no, it's still um, very dear to me, and I think if I moved back to London, I would definitely consider... You know, going back there because it does feel, you know, even though I'm, I know it's, you know, I'm sure it's changed significantly. It sounds like Tesco Metro's in in those pubs, and um, I heard that the Trinity's changed a lot. That used to be our local kind of office lunchtime uh, meeting room, <laughs> um, but you know, no, it's still, I think, it's still got that. Uh, it's got the history and it's got the, um, it's got the the mix, um, the racial mix, which is to me is uh, is so important and so valuable.